You are joining Making a Difference with Melissa Clark, a new show that shares the compelling stories and voices of well-known and everyday people who change the world in big and small ways. Enjoy our guests. Call in or just listen to be inspired. For this show was made with you in mind. Please join us every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with our special guests. And you can listen to our recast at www.melissaclarkshow.com. Hey guys, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us on a Saturday. I hope everybody's doing good despite what we're going through. Um, Governor Cuomo just came on today and he said that New York has the most cases, over 6,000 uh, people that are affected with the coronavirus. And Brooklyn is actually the biggest borough. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're very happy about that. Um, I'm staying home with my animal and uh, just trying to relax. And what I've been doing to relax is listening to Jay Shetty, Deepak Chopra, who we have on the cover of Preferred Health Magazine. So we've been listening to him. They have meditations daily. And I've also been listening to uh, Camelia um, McConaughey. I don't know if I said her name right, C Camelia. Uh, she's wonderful. That's Matthew McConaughey's wife. And she... Um, she is so positive, and these are just the people that I've been doing just to get through this whole thing, uh, talking to friends and family, and um, just getting our reporting out with um, the local papers. We do Canarsie Courier. I work for um, Kings County Politics. So it's just been crazy. I've been listening to this day in and day out. I'm destroyed, exhausted, but I am so happy to have this show today with these wonderful people. Um, I have two great gentlemen on today. And one of them is Mr. Bill Tosh. Hello, sir. <laughs> How are you? How are you? I'm fine. I'm home uh, doing the Jane Fonda workout. <laughs> uh, is that what you've been doing to keep your your uh, your time your time occupied? Yeah, and uh, I still have the record. I don't even have the video. <laughs> Living the pain. I'm surprised I made it onto your show. <laughs> Bill, you're the best of the best. I'm so excited to have you, Bill, and thank you so much for being here. How are you holding up with all this, with the coronavirus? Uh, it's, it's depressing. Yeah, <laughs> it is. But trying to just go, well, maybe it'll go away, you know. But uh, then every time you look at the news or uh, your telephone, anything anymore, you know, it's all you see. It just... Uh, and then you yeah. ask yourself if it's real, how much of it's getting blown out of proportion? I, I don't know. I don't have an answer. Yeah, it really is because, you know, yesterday I kind of gave my family a scare. I shouldn't have done this, but I heard from an inside scoop that, that uh, they're going to close everything down. I automatically called up my family and I shouldn't have done that. So next time I'm waiting until Governor Cuomo, you know, as a reporter, I shouldn't really do that with my family and scare them. Um, but uh, next time I'll just. I was going to say, at least you didn't sell your stocks when you first heard about it, like uh, some people. That's all gone. <laughs> I know they did do that, right? Oh my God, what is wrong with people? It's going to come back up and I think everything's going to be fine. But for right now, we just have to buckle down, do the right thing, stay at home and uh, just communicate this way. But I'm, I'm, I'm just over the moon to have you over. You're, you're a legend. And I really wanted to show a video on CNN uh, of all your accomplishments. You've interviewed so many people, but I also want to just share this photo. Hang on one second, please. Let me see if I can do this. Here we go. Look at this. <laughs> Uh, and you posted something today in regards to Kenny Rogers. You you interviewed him, correct? Well, I, I'll tell you the, the whole story. We had a show in 1980 on TBS called Tush, which was mm -hmm. my last name. And we had a, a guy on the show that did an impersonation of Kenny. Mm -hmm. And 
the guy was, I mean, it was really funny. We did, you know, quite a takeoff on the fact that at that time, Kenny was known as being so wealthy and he was buying this and buying that. So we did a takeoff on all that. Well, Kenny had seen it and he became a fan of of our show and especially of that guy, Eddie Lee was his name that played Kenny. Mm -hmm. And so that was in 1980. Now, that was the year that I was four, born, Bill. Oh, my God. Well, then you Sorry. knew nothing. Oh, <laughs> thank God for you two. <laughs> but anyway, what happened was, uh, you know, years go by. I mean, I, I had no contact with Kenny or whatever. Mm-hmm. And now I'm involved with a movie theater here in Atlanta in the neighborhood Kenny was living in. And it turns out he was a regular at the movie theater. Really? Yeah, so he would come in with two kids to see, mostly with his two kids and his wife, Wanda. Mm -hmm. And they would, you know, in the morning and watch a movie and very uh, low key. I don't think a lot of people even knew it was Kenny because he always came just in a a sweatsuit and his kids were with him. And he had two two twins. Well, that's kind of redundant. He had Mm -hmm. two babies that were twins. And uh, they would just, you know, watch a lot of of the G-rated movies, a lot of the cartoon stuff. But uh, what happened, the last time I saw Kenny was about a year and a half ago, maybe a little longer. He came in and uh, I saw him coming out of the theater and he was just hunched over and he was trying to get his coat on. I was helping him. He told me he had just gone through open heart surgery. And he said he wasn't doing well. He said he wasn't doing well. And it was right after that he announced his retirement. And then today, of course, I read that he passed away. So he's been in poor health for about a year and a half, maybe longer. And wow. uh, I'm, I'm glad I got to know him you know, after 1980. And the funny thing was, I don't think he ever put together that I was the same guy from the TV show. <laughs> just knew the guy that uh, was part of this movie theater. And we used to have some nice conversations about different things. Never, never really showbiz stuff. So it was kind of, I mean, I'm kind of sad that he passed away. Yeah, he was 81. Um, I grew up listening to him because my mother was obsessed with him. So he was like a family friend, you know, and, and uh, I was, you know, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Half part of my childhood is gone. Um, And my mother passed away, you know, a couple years ago. So. So I was to say, like you said, he's a family friend. I think, he kind of came across that. He yeah. came across as an average guy. Mm-hmm. But he, he, he made a bit, I don't know if a lot of people remember this or not, but in the 70s, mm-hmm. before he made a comeback, he was doing a commercial for guitar, the get, uh, Kenny Rogers guitar lesson. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those 800 numbers that you could call and get lessons. And I guess they sent you a tape or something. Mm-hmm. But it was, Kenny used to do these commercials. And then he made a comeback. And those commercials disappeared. I guess he did a buyout. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's that's really nice that you have that memory with him. Um, I want to start with how you began. Now, you're an Emmy Award winning journalist. And I had asked you, please, you know, can you kindly show us, show us your Emmy, please? I know you don't like this, but just do it for us. <laughs> it's over there. <laughs> Bill, I told you to put it in the back. <laughs> I'd have to walk past the pool area, past the tennis courts, uh, get in my golf cart and drive to where I can <laughs> I wanted people to see that, but that's okay because you are so amazing. How did uh, you get? Uh, how did you look get? Alike. <laughs> Bill, you know you're amazing. Um, tell us when did you? How did you get started in journalism, and how did you start with CNN working for Ted Turner? All right. Well, the, you know this is a long story. So that's okay. Here. We have we have another fifteen minutes. Okay. Uh, First of all, you know, people refer to me as a journalist. Mm -hmm. Well, entertainment news. So there was real, there was no, to me, a journalist is a person that that gets into the story and like a Walter Cronkite or a uh, Sam Donaldson, if you remember him, you know, those, Mm -hmm. those, you know, get into a news story and they check it out and they do the facts and and then I, I, you know, I interviewed movie stars. There wasn't a lot of journalism that it was. It was mostly just, you know, uh, fun and games. And that's what it started out as. I didn't start out as a, 
a journalist. Uh, I was the announcer for Ted Turner's local television station in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1974. And I started doing a newscast, but it was, again, it wasn't journalism because we didn't really have news on the air. It was at three o'clock in the morning. It was just me sitting in front of a camera reading, reading news right. just to fill the time and also a commitment that you had to do so much public affairs time. Well, it suddenly turned into a comedy show because we didn't think anybody was watching at three o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So we just were having fun with it and it caught on. It became a cult thing. That led into what I mentioned that Kenny Rogers was on, or the fellow that did the parody of Kennedy, of Kennedy, of Kenny. Uh, you know, we, we did this Tush show for one year. And then I did a lot of other shows after that. And then it eventually ended up with being Showbiz Today on CNN in New York. Wow. And that's, I just made a transition from TBS to CNN. There was never any real trying to get a job with CNN kind of thing. See, I was there when CNN started. I mean, I was there the day Ted announced he was going to try me. Mm -hmm. People said, we can't do it. No, nobody's going to pay attention to a 24-hour day news channel. You can't do it. Right. That's what he told us. And here we are today. In the did, you go to, did you go to school for journalism or any um, literature? No. No, no. I, I was, my whole career was self-taught. I mean, from the time I was a little kid, I wanted to be involved in radio and television. And that was just where my whole mind was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was not a good student in school because I, I had no interest in, <laughs> in all that. You know, I just, uh, I mean, I got by. But, mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to be on television. I wanted to be on radio. And, uh, you know, what's funny is I used to think, God, I, mean, I must have been strange being, you know, 15 years old and being on the radio somewhere. And now with Facebook, there are so many people that tell these stories. I find out there must have been 500,000 15-year-old kids on the radio. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, was 15 and got a job in radio, they only got the job because nobody else wanted to have the responsibility of doing it. I was the first job I ever had. I was made the morning man of a mm -hmm. radio. They said, mm -hmm. here are the kids. Here, you're the morning man. And you would go in there, and it wasn't like there were other people setting things up. You were by yourself. It was because nobody else who worked at the station wanted to get up at four in the morning and be mm -hmm. on the air at six. So give it to the kid. Let him do it. Did any of that make any sense? <laughs> I love it so much. But you've interviewed top people. I'm talking, I wanted to show a video, and we're going to put it in. But you, Robert De Niro, Sarah Jessica Parker, uh, Michael Douglas. Well, you know, you think about it, it was, it was CNN, mm -hmm. and they, you know, they're part of a publicity machine. When a new movie comes out, you know, I mean, anybody that watches television these days knows that uh, if, if, if uh, Harrison Ford has a new movie coming out, all of a sudden, for one weekend in a row, every time you turn on the television, there's Harrison Ford promoting his new movie. Mm -hmm. So that's interviewed all these people. You know, it wasn't... Uh, that we had, I think the CNN name helped a lot. I mean, if I were, you know, Tommy Smith from some channel in Biloxi, Mississippi, I don't think I would get all these big stars, but because you're CNN, you know, right. they, come, they come to you. So that's why we had all the big stars. Did you love that life, Mr. Bill? I, uh, I did at times, and you did the same thing. I mean, there, there are times yeah. when, uh, you know, it sounds silly, but there are times when there are parties you didn't want to go to or movies you didn't want to go to. You just said, no, I don't want to do that tonight. Yeah. But, you know, it was a glamorous life. It was, uh, you know, I didn't realize how glamorous till the years go by and somebody will ask me what I did and I'll tell them and they'll think, my God, you met those people, you did that, you did this, you went there, you know I mean? I flew in the Concorde to Paris once. I, uh, you yeah. know, it was a, uh, what's your, they just postponed it, the Cannes Film Festival. Yeah. Uh, we were in Australia for something. We, you know, we would travel all over the place uh, to, to do the television show. And I mean, you know, I don't know how I did it when I look back at it because I was always flying somewhere and wow. going somewhere. But, uh, and, and now I, 
I sit in my large estate here. <laughs> <laughs> did you, um, did that put a strain on your family's life at all, traveling like that? Well, I think my family came in, in different steps. My first marriage mm -hmm. was before I got to be known. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, things started to snowball with Turner Broadcast into my own popularity and this and that. And mm -hmm. my wife was content being just home with, the, at that time, our, our son, who was maybe two or three years old. And I was traveling all over the place. And I was into the glamour end of things. So yeah, it had a strain on that marriage. Uh, the second marriage, no, now I'm going down the list of marriages. <laughs> it just came and went. <laughs> do you think that's, oh, all right. No, I'm just wondering, do you think women would want to be with you because of who you were? What's that? Do you think that women would have wanted to, you know, been with you because of who you were and your celebrity, you know? <laughs> Maybe that had, I know the third one did, yeah. Yeah. Third, yeah, because there was a chance to uh, hook on to a glamorous thing that person always wanted. Right. Then, you know, here's my perfect uh, perfect attachment to that. I get a hold of him, I'll just ride on his coattails. <laughs> and then about four years into the marriage, I retired. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. Another one bites the dust. Um, <laughs> hey, I, I saw that you interviewed Betty Davis. How was that? She was sitting there smoking a cigarette. That was pretty cool. You know, that was another one that was that. See, now that was that was a case of I don't think it just being CNN. I think it was a case of the things fell in together, mm -hmm. and uh, she was getting some kind of an. Now you're making me think back on this. She was getting some kind of an award. Mm -hmm. I was doing it in Los Angeles at the time on CNN. I was living in LA and she was getting some award and we were at the Bonaventure Hotel in downtown LA where she was and we stopped her on the way out and she just says, yeah, sure, I'll do the, and she was Betty Davis, the elderly Betty Davis. Right. And it was a song, Betty Davis Eyes, by the way. It was the same time as the song. But what I always remember is we sat on a bench in the lobby of the hotel mm -hmm. and all the photographers were around us, all the paparazzi, all the CNN guys were sitting up and Betty was sitting next to me and the photographers are all yelling her name, Miss Davis, Betty, look here, look here. They all wanted her to look at the camera, their camera, you know what I mean? Right. And she goes, and I thought only Betty Davis could say this, she goes, Take your pictures, boys. I'll rotate. <laughs> That's so diva. <laughs> what a great line. And then she left behind, when she got up and left, she left behind her uh, cigarette case. Okay. The old cigarette case was sitting there next to me. And, and I called out, Is Miss Davis, your cigarette case. And she turned around. I swear to God, she was doing a Betty Davis impersonation. She looked at me. She says, isn't it just like me? <laughs> oh my gosh she just turned into betty david yeah. that's so great how old was she then when you did that interview it was about 107 <laughs> no i no 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 i think she was i don't i guess she must have been late 70s i'd have to look back and see you know when she passed on i don't so the yeah, interview she... was, the interview was around 83 1983 so you okay. whatever it is there but she wow. was elderly. She yeah. was very funny. She was very nice. And she was Betty Davis. Yeah. You know? wow. Those were my favorite, my favorite interviews. You know, people always say, Oh, do you meet uh, Tom Cruise? Have you met uh, you know Meg Ryan or whatever they mentioned these names? But to me, the my favorites were always the real old stars. Because that was my fascination with movies. It goes back to the 40s, the 30s and 40s. Love it. And when you get to meet somebody like, like that, like Vincent Price, my God, I was, I couldn't believe I was talking to Vincent Price, and he was so funny and and so nice, you know. And, and he was my hero growing up. And here I was, I got to hang out with him. And uh, Dana Andrews, I don't know if you remember Dana Andrews or not. Uh, Eddie Albert, of all people, 
green yeah. acres. He was yeah. alive. When you look at Eddie Albert's career, there's a guy that did, uh, you know, a, a, a gazillion movies. Always everybody's best friend, Eddie Albert. Well, Mr. Bill, was all these on Turner Classics with these these actors that you're around? It wasn't around in those days. Oh, uh, yeah, Turner Classics started in the somewhere in the nineties. Oh, in the nineties, I remember my father used to watch that a lot. uh, I did too, but then I I got to be honest with you, Mm. I was the people that because I was with Turner Broadcasting and because we started TBS, which was the the first cable super station, mm-hmm. and then CNN, which is a lot of people don't even know what CNN stands for anymore, but it's cable news network. But uh, a couple months ago, I had my cable disconnected. <laughs> I, I don't need this anymore, and I, I felt you know I, it's almost like I didn't want anybody to know it <laughs> because I was you know I was one of the guys that used to tell everybody cable was the future, and right. then I realized. You know, I don't need, now I'm blasting myself, uh, I don't need 50 news channels. I don't need 50 sports channels. I don't watch them. And to be frank with you, Turner Classic Movies, to me, they just start showing the same movies over and over and over again. Right. And and then they kept bringing in these hosts to introduce the movies that were driving me nuts because they would tell me the same stuff I already knew. So I said, I don't need this. I got rid of it. What year did you leave um, CNN? 2002. 2002. Yeah, after, after 9-11 happened, uh, there was really no more entertainment news. It wow. dried. Uh, and I was coming to work every day. I was, at that time, the last two years, I was living in Woodstock. Mm-hmm. And I would take the train and I would take Amtrak in there. So I was traveling 116 miles a day to work each way. Wow. And that sounds kind of nuts, but I did it. And surprisingly, every morning, it was the same group of people on the Amtrak platform doing the same goofy thing as me going into their jobs, too. You know? But then what, 9-11 what? happened. Mm-hmm. Hmm? I was going to say 9-11 happened, which I heard about, as a matter of fact, on the train that morning going into work. And uh, after that, it was it was a whole new ball game. There was no more entertainment news. It was all, uh, you know, World Trade Center all the time. Mm-hmm. So after about six months, I said, you know, this is insane. So I got in contact with the powers that be mm-hmm. and talked it over. And so after 30 years, I retired. And the only phone call I got from anybody was from Ted. Uh-huh. Ted called why are you leaving and I mm-hmm. told him and the back words to me were I'm out too because <laughs> wow. time was, bought him out do you um still talk to Mr. Turner now I was at his birthday party last year it was the last time I, I actually saw him and talked to him uh his 80th birthday party wow and, and he's got some he's got some problems now with uh I guess some form of dementia uh, and, uh, you know, it, when I talked to him, we, you know, he was very coherent. Everything was fine. But I could see during the night he would drift off and he would be yeah. talking when you could see he went to wherever. It's kind of sad to think all the great memories that man has that that just be forgotten. Yeah. Do you thank him for your career? Like, yeah. do, you, do you give him a lot of credit? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 1974, when I started working for him, uh, if I hadn't walked into that television station at the day and the time that I did, I would have never gotten that job. I would have never worked. I would have probably uh, got a job driving a truck (laughs) (laughs) somewhere. Stumbled from radio station to radio station. Were you satisfied with your career? Did you like... um... Like what well, you did? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, people will mention something to me that I did, you know, they'll say, oh, you did that or you did that. And I always think at least I did something that people remember, you know. Mm-hmm. And there's you, you're doing that thing with YouTube before. Mm-hmm. 
you know, now that's around. And so all that stuff is still out there. You know, stuff that I did. That's, that's kind of fun. There were things I would change. Right. I would have harder. I would have, I wouldn't have had as much fun as I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I had a ball. I had a great time and I should have worked harder. I should have been miserable more. <laughs> <laughs> At least you still kept your humor. I wasn't miserable enough. <laughs> what did you um? What did you win the Emmys for? And how many do you have? I think you have like three of them. Three, and that were, they were all uh, one in the South and the Southeast. And there was one was for the Tush Show. One was performer, uh, you know, on television, and the I guess the Southern region. I don't. And I don't know what the other one's for. I don't know. Are you origi I, you're originally from New York, right? No, originally oh. uh, many, many years ago from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Which I never, I never visit anymore. I don't see it anymore. Yeah. There's no, do you hear my clock over there? I have no. timing clocks in my vast <laughs> So what are you doing with your time now? How are you, how are you occupying your time? <laughs> this Colono virus or whatever it is. Uh, don't cough. That's not a good sign. I've been, I haven't uh, been feeling good. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> oh, my God. Please help me. <laughs> thing here. Thank God uh, we're on virtual. Well, you know, as I said, I, I was involved. And we're closed down now, but I was involved with a movie theater here in town because I love movies and uh, I had the opportunity to, to be, be with that group. Mm. So I got involved with that and that would keep me busy during the day. Mm -hmm. And basically I was, you know, working five days a week like anybody else. Sitting around, now I'm sitting around doing nothing. Are you gonna do any, are you gonna read a book? Are you gonna read a book that you always wanted to read or do something that you always wanted to do? No, I don't mean, no. I, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call you ever so often and we'll have conversations. <laughs> you can't go outside. You can't go hang out anywhere. You can't call anybody to meet you for lunch. Yeah. You know, well, we're all in the same boat here. I know. Shoes. I know. In other people's shoes and shine them. <laughs> <laughs> You have some humor. I can't wait. I got to go off. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. I'm good. I just have allergies. Um, okay. uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, it's, I'll tell you, the past, it's been four days of sitting around doing nothing. It's, it's pretty, yeah. I, I run. I do that. They close the gyms. I can't even go there anymore. But you're going outside, right? You're you're walking outside. Yeah, yeah, I go. Out. And there are other people. Actually, today I was walking outside, and a woman was coming towards me, oh and God. she and got t ten feet away from me. You know, because she didn't want to be. I guess it's social distancing thing or whatever. <laughs> Did you have it? Eric, there. Either that or I look like a mugger. I don't. You're so funny. All right, Mr. Bill, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome to stay on if you'd like. Uh, I'm going to talk to a, an actor who's been around for a long time. Uh, but I want to okay. thank you so much for everything. You're the best. Well, thank you. It was fun. I enjoyed it. I hope I said something that was worth listening to. Absolutely. Where can people find you on uh, Instagram? Uh, actually, Facebook. I'm under my name. I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to promote you here. <laughs> I'll promote you on my own. I'll do it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love you. I love you too. I'll talk to you. Thank Bye, you. Melissa. I'll Bye. talk to you later. <laughs> Bye. Oh my God. Help. Hi. Don. Hello. I'm not on here. Hi, Eric. <laughs> oh, hey, I'm here. There you are. Hey. Are. I, had a, I had a button that I didn't see. Oh, good. How you doing? 
I'm doing well. How about you? How about that cough? I don't know. <laughs> we'll find out in a couple sure of days. It's fine. It's all I'm this sure. other stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just have like a dry cough and I usually have allergies and I have rashes all over my body. I think it's, I'm very nervous about this whole thing because I've been writing so much about it. So mm -hmm. we'll all be okay. How are you, sir? Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. I'm up at my girlfriend's house in Brookline, Mass. And we're riding Amen. up to the farm. But uh, going for, we went for a nice run today and a little workout in the park. Nice. Well, is she visible or no? I'm sorry? Does she, does she want to say hi? Is she, she around? She would prefer not to. Okay, she, we'll see her hands. She's a scientist. Ah, all right. Uh, <laughs> God bless her. Nice, yeah. nice to meet you. <laughs> so, Eric, you are originally from Rhode Island, and I lived in yeah. Rhode Island for 10 years, and we actually have a lot of friends in common. So, um, can we talk about Rhode Island for like two seconds? All you wish. I would I love Rhode Island. I love it. Um, where are you originally from in Rhode Island? Charlestown, which is uh, oh. Southern Shore. Mm -hmm. uh, from my beach, you could look out and see Black Island about 10 miles away. And uh, wow. when, I, when I paint now and I do uh, ocean scenes and I put Black Island in, people know exactly that that's Charlestown Beach. It's kind of an iconic thing that I love to do. I love it so much. Wow. I, I used to live in New... I lived in Newport for a while. I lived in Coventry. I lived in North okay. Providence. Yeah. Uh, but Newport has my heart. I stay at the Pelham all the time. Yeah, I lived in Newport too. Uh, mm. I love Newport. And I worked in one of the mansions. And, uh, oh, wow. Yeah, I love it there. Yeah. Is that one of your paintings behind us? That's weird. You know what? It is. <laughs> yeah, what a coinky dink. There. Yeah, that's one of my clogs. Ah, uh, that's nice. Yeah, you have a very nice, um, it's all scenic, right? Your artwork is all... Yeah, I mean, I, I've done uh, all kinds of things, and I, I'm a big fan of um, vintage pinup, like the classic Vargas type, you know, whimsical, um, kind of bright color graphic design, you know, women holding flowers and like advertising art from the mm -hmm. 50s and 60s. And mm -hmm. I've, um, I've done a number of portraits for people like that, where I put their face in this thing and that uh, portraits I don't really enjoy because I'm a little too honest I think when I paint and okay. sometimes you don't need to paint all the wrinkles and all the lines and you know when 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 your facial recognition identifies the portrait and then the person that's commissioned you goes it doesn't look anything like me and then, oh, and then you show them like facial identification would beg to differ so. yeah well I would think the authenticity would be very flattering you know yeah. Yeah. Um, let's reverse. I want to go all the way back to when you started as an actor. You've worked with so many people. I've seen you. Yeah. I, I must have been like in my teens watching you on Frasier and, you know. Ouch. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> God love you. you. You look great. Listen, I, I think as men get older, they get more handsome. So I think I told you that once. I'm like, you know. But um, yeah, so you've worked. Sorry to the girlfriend. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, uh, so you've worked on with Ellen, you've worked with uh, Leah Thompson. Mm -hmm. And uh, so tell us, how did you get in, uh, started in acting? Well, first of all, growing up in Charlestown, um, it's a small <laughs> beach community. And we, uh, I went to a regional high school. So there were four different grammar schools that made up my high school. And mm -hmm. even with all that, I graduated in a class of 180. So we didn't have the resources for like a good drama program or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So my buddies and I were just big Monty Python fans and we would at a school assembly ask for five minutes to do like the lumberjack song or some, you know, the cheese shop skit or something. And I loved it. I loved that feeling. I was, you know, the big jock in school. And, but I loved that idea of making people laugh and performing. Mm -hmm. So the summer, <clears throat> my senior year going into college, the University of Rhode Island, that summer I did a play. I did the pajama game and I played Sid Sorokin, the lead guy who sings, you know, Hey there, you know, Fernando Sideway, all that. And I'm not, mm. I wasn't, I'm still not a, much of a singer, but I could pull it off. And I loved it. I was hooked. So I majored in theater at URI. My parents always said, you can do anything you want in life. You just got to go to college. And then around junior year of high school, I also found out I'd also have to pay for said college. So I, I went to URI. It was great. And I majored in theater and had a great time. And uh, all along, art was always my first and always my truest passion. Mm -hmm. But my dad was a really well-established marine artist. And as much as he encouraged me, he also wanted me to do exactly what he did. And as mm -hmm. an artist, I, I needed to find my own way. 
so I rebelled and became an actor. Started, I did every play I could in college and then worked up in Boston and in Summer Stock Theater and went to New York and then started getting day players on soaps and commercials. I get to shoot overseas a bunch of times. And I loved it. I was in New York being a working actor. This is now in the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. And then around 94, I started being put on tape for shows out in LA, like video auditioning. But it was before the digital revolution. So you'd have a 48 hour turnaround between sending the tape out, getting feedback. I might, you know, pack a bag, you might be going out, you might book it. And eventually my manager at the time just said, look, you, you just got to be in LA, just come to LA. Mm -hmm. So I did. And I immediately booked the role on Frasier, which really kicked off my career. Mm -hmm. And, but those, it, it kind of looks from the outside, like, you know, I kind of was like, Hey, hold my beer. I'm going to go to LA and become an actor. And it's not that it was a 15 year overnight success. Mm -hmm. So by the time I get to LA, a lot of those people had seen me in plays in New York or seen me on little things that I'd done and knew my work, or at the very least saw my audition tapes because I auditioned for Grub Street Productions, which did Wings, Frasier, and all those shows. Mm -hmm. So when I get to LA, immediately I read for Frasier, and I thought, I didn't know how it worked. Like the, the casting director called me in and, oh wow, I have an audition with Jeff Greenberg. He's the casting director of Wings, and I, I know they saw my tape for that show, and I get to remind him that that's me. And I was clueless. I walk in, he comes out, he's like, Eric Lutz, let me welcome you to LA. He gave me a big hug and he goes, I love your work and I would love to be the guy that puts you on the map. Because he's just yeah. a fan. I always say it's better to, to my younger actors that I mentor or when I teach, it's better to have one or two really solid uh, casting directors that love your work than 15 casting directors that, that know you. Jeff Greenberg really believed in me, pushed for me. Long and the short is I got the role in Frazier that revolutionized my career. And when that happened, I was in Texas shooting a show with um, um, Lorenzo Lamas and mm -hmm. John Schneider. And it was, it was one of these uh, episodic shows. And uh, I went back to my hotel. It was airing the first time when I was shooting. And I came back to my hotel and the phone had blown up. I was getting messages from different agents in Los Angeles and directors and like, I want to meet you at, at your own location, but would you get back? I want to have lunch with you. And it just blew up and suddenly everything, everything just, you know, so many times I thought I had my big break. I did my first big acting job with, uh, with uh, George Kennedy and um, David Carradine. I thought, wow, this is my big break. And it wasn't, it, it got me some buzz, but you know, one thing would happen and then it would just, you know, it didn't necessarily translate to the next thing. Frazier put me on the map and I never looked back and then just got offers and it, it just started coming. And I had to pick which I had technically a four way test deal for, uh, for pilot season that year. Mm -hmm. And because David Hyde Pierce, who I'd been working with on Frazier, encouraged me to really look at Caroline in the city because he was friend, he's friends with Marco Panette and uh, his now husband was also involved in the writing team of that. And he said, that's, that is the role you should take because this show has the backing of the network and they're going to assemble a great cast. And so I, I, it sounds crazy, but I get to pick, I'll go with Caroline. I still had to test, still had to do all that, but yeah. that show, how, I didn't even know what upfronts were. That's where they announced the new season in New York at Lincoln center. And when I got the call from Fred Barron, one of the creators, I remember I was walking on San Fernando in Burbank, you know, where they have that big Galleria and I had my big Nokia cell phone and it was like ringing. And I answer it and he say, hey, it's Fred. Guess what? We got picked up. We're going to the upfronts next week. What does that mean? I, I knew nothing. Like I knew nothing about how it all worked. And in a way that was good. Just like when I, to jump ahead several years, when I did a guest star on how to get away with murder, I, mm -hmm. I just didn't realize that was Viola Davis's show. And I never watched it. I knew, yeah. the, I knew the style of it. But after I booked it, I, I watched it that night. And I thought, oh my gosh. Good thing I didn't know. This is like such a good show. You never know. That stuff can mess with your head, you know. But I've, I'm kind of a Forrest Gump. I just kind of go with it. I'm like, eh. You know, my agent calls one day. You want to go to Toronto for four weeks and do a film with the Olsen twins? This is when they were still little, you know, like 12 or something. I didn't know who they were. Yeah. I'm like, and he told me how much money I was going to get. I'm like, I'll do it. He goes, well, don't you want to read the script? I'm like, you kidding? I just go to Toronto and stay in a fancy hotel and make that kind of coin for yeah. a family show. And I had kids coming at the time. And I thought, this is great. I mean, it's been, it's been like a wild, fun ride. Wow. Were you in any uh, big films? 
besides uh, your series? <laughs> yeah, it was mostly a TV guy. So I did a lot of big TV mm. films. I've done a lot of really cool uh, lower budget or indie films. But yeah. I was just in the fairly recently released um, movie Vault that Tommy Danucci from Rhode Island mm -hmm. uh, directed, wrote, co-wrote and directed. And I actually flew back from, from LA to shoot that out in Providence. And uh, it was like a dream come true. And I got to work with Clive Standen, who is uh, Rollo on the Vikings. And um, he's in the new Taken series and uh, Theo Rossi from Sons of Anarchy and Luke Cage. And, uh, and it was based on a true story. And that was, that was a feature film that, that got out there. And uh, I was top of show billing. So it was like, you know, the front of the credits. So that was good. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, sometimes I forget some of the stuff I've done. Did you ever work with the Cone brothers or the Farley brothers? No, I, uh, the Farley brothers were, I was in the mix for one of their, for um, me, myself and Irene. Mm -hmm. That was the one. And they ended up, I was told they cast their brother-in-law. I get it. It's their movie. You know what I mean? Of course, yeah. that would have been brilliant. But, uh, <laughs> you know, those things, so I always say sometimes you're the bird, sometimes you're the windshield. Sometimes did, you're, mm. Yeah, totally. How did you feel playing? Uh, you played a lot of gay guys in, in your in the series. How did you feel about that? Being a straight male, did what it makes um... you straight? <laughs> to call back to one of the lines in Frasier, it never occurred to me you were gay, and I go, it never occurred to me you might be straight. That's right. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. I, I grew up in a kind of a kooky household. That's a whole. That's a whole other episode. But you know, it was a very artsy home and everything. And my parents were as much as they could be completely provincial at times, they were also very open-minded. And mm -hmm. I just never grew up uh, with any of that homophobia or anything. And we, we always had artists at the house, and artsy people. And I just thought they were artsy, I didn't know. And, and then, um, so, I, you know, it sounds trite, but I have a lot of dear friends that are gay. And back in the day when I was in New York, yeah. as a straight guy, like I, I, I supported them. I do the gay pride parade and everything. So it, 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 but that was only, you know, 25, 30 years ago. And it was a right. big deal. So at the time, I, Jeff Greenberg, the casting director of Frasier, explained to me that a lot of even gay actors didn't want to touch a gay role. And I thought, that's, I'm sorry, but that's BS. That's crazy. Right. So I, it's a good role. I don't care what the orientation is. I don't have to. I've played murderers. I've never killed anybody mm -hmm. that, that I know of. And... <laughs> You know what I mean? And so yeah. it's the human condition. We're all in a, and, and I also, when I teach, look, we're all in a spectrum, sexually, mm -hmm. uh, mentally. I have an autistic daughter. She's, you know, more in the autism spectrum, but it's all a spectrum and it's all just the, the human condition. So I loved it. And I love that uh, my fan base is uh, a lot of gay folks. It's fine. You know? How did, how did you feel when Ellen got canceled for coming out? I, I knew it would, but I knew that I, something told me that she's going to spin this into the next level. And in a way, it's the best thing she could have done. And you know what? Even if she didn't come out, that show felt like it had run its course. And they'd started switching out some of the main characters. I think Ari Gross left. Mm -hmm. um, you start, when you start seeing that, they're, they're trying to figure out how to make it, keep it pertinent and interesting. So I think it was running its course anyway. And it's kind of ironic. I, was, I think I was her last straight relationship on that show yeah so, uh, i'm a home wrecker and uh <laughs> I, I think that um it was awesome what she did it was brilliant mm -hmm. and good for her the way she did it and typical ellen she does everything with class and you know so here's a woman who she's ellen to genders right she's mm -hmm. at a whole different level of fame i ran into her four or five years ago in la and she was having dinner with Portia de Rossi. And my friends were like, oh, you should go say hi. I don't want to bother her. She's not going to remember me. I, I worked for a, a week on her show as a guest star. And I was yeah. kind of walking by the table. And on the way out, she kind of looked at me. And I go, yeah, I remember I played the book. Oh, my God, how are you? She gave me a big uh -huh. hug. And like, how cool is that? You know, because at a certain point, you just meet so many people all the time. Yeah. And it's all high affect. You know, how do you? I don't know. She's just cool. She's so humble. Yeah. Um, let's, can we talk about, uh, your Lyme disease that you contracted? Sure. Okay. So sure. when did you, um, contract that? Uh, it was 2014 mm -hmm. when I got it. Mm -hmm. And uh, with it, I got something called Babesia, mm -hmm. which is uh, North American malaria. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what manifested the right away. I got 104, 105 fever, 
was hallucinating. I had the worst pains and chills I've ever had. That's what got me to the doctor because Lyme disease can be pretty insidious. It just kind of creeps in there sometimes and you feel tired, you feel run down. This, I was, I, I'd never been so sick. And I don't go to the doctor, like, just because I don't feel well. I, mm -hmm. I work it out, you know. Uh, I went and immediately my doctor goes, yeah, you've got Lyme disease and probably Babesia. What? And there was actually a wow. third pathogen you could get. I can't remember the name of it, but I think she was almost a little bummed that I didn't have the trifecta. But I got the help I needed right away, and I got all the, the Z-Pack and the, all the different medications they put you on. And so for a month, I had to take like three or four different meds that just make you sick anyway, mm -hmm. especially for the Babesia. There was this yellow fluid I had to take. And it jacked up my liver. I lost all this weight. I got super skinny and weak. And I went from, you know, throwing around a lot of weight at the gym to like, I couldn't put 20 pounds over my head without shaking. Wow. But, and that's within a month. It just all went down. And, um, but being an optimist, I was able to buy the skinny clothes for once. <laughs> I'm a big bone boy, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I also discovered apparently I don't have very big bones. I just have a big appetite. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, so uh, it was interesting to go through that. Mm -hmm. And I believe everything has a purpose in life. And one of the lessons I needed to learn was more patience with um, people that have chronic conditions. Because I would, you know, like the guy that just doesn't go to the doctor unless there's a bone sticking out. Right. I, the school thought, well, just tough it out. Just, you know, suck it up. And then you get wild through something like that. And now I have so much more compassion for people that do suffer with fibromyalgia, chronic pain, um, just any, any disease, you know, because it, it happened to me, you know? Yeah. So with the coronavirus, I'm like, ah, I'll be fine. You know what? I might not be, but I got to keep positive. But if yeah. I got Lyme disease and this rare Babesia, I can get this thing so I'm holding up with Sarah and we're gonna you know see this thing through together what kind of scientist is she if you don't mind me asking does she do, <laughs> does she do medicine <laughs> can she, she help us with this <laughs> it's basically the biomed the biomed field I just call her a scientist because she cracks up because to me she's a scientist so when she hangs out with my actor and artist friends mm -hmm. they're like so you're a scientist she's like oh, but I, I'm like, honey, to us, you're a scientist. Yeah. But so because um, she's been in this field for many years, she's familiar with this stuff. And so when the first rumblings of the coronavirus came out, I was getting a lot of really scientific information instead of, I feel like it could be this or that, it, you know. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I've kind of got some insight on that, which is cool. Is she, is she worried? Look at her face right now. <laughs> is she worried about this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Concerned, but I would concerned, say concerned. But, yeah. I'm taking the right steps, but not worried. Because worry, again, worry, fear does nothing but shut you down. Yeah. You need to be concerned. You need to have the precautions in place and take it seriously. But worry and fear, all that's going to do is make you sicker. I mean, yeah. it can cause cancer, chronic worry yeah. and regret and all that. So yeah, yeah. We're, we're taking precautions and we're good. Okay, good. Very good. Stay, stay nice and healthy. Um, and let's talk about your art. We have a couple of more minutes, if you don't mind. Okay. When did you start uh, painting? How old well, like you? I said, I grew up in a house that mm -hmm. my dad was a painter. He was, he was, he did pretty well. He kept stops himself, and he really wanted me to take up his mantle. And sadly, I didn't do it professionally until after he passed away in two thousand and one. Mm -hmm. But I would always have art supplies, and I'd go on location. I'd always have at least a drawing pad with me and pencils and blending stubs and then um, sometimes if I like in Carolina I would bring paints and play with those until they started yelling at me because I was getting paint on my wardrobe <laughs> can you not on show day at least you know yeah. and I remember on the Regis and Kathy Lee show dating myself I made a joke about um, my art is um, th that's my real passion and acting is just my survival job until my art career takes off and uh, and it has and, and it's really segue into being like it's it gives me such a pleasure and a, a deep satisfaction. It feels more like a calling than acting ever was. So I love acting. I'm still in it. I still do a couple films a year or pilot here and there. And, you know, I get a few things that are percolating. But in the meantime, I've moved back to Rhode Island where I'm from. I'm in my element. I paint uh, boats and seascapes and shells and rocks. I don't know why, but beach rocks are really fun to do. And people dig them and they buy them. So... 
I love it so much. I'm going to post it as we're talking about this. I'll post it when they edit it. Okay. So I'll, I'll show your artwork. Uh, do you have a gallery that you belong to? Yeah, my main gallery is in Charlestown, Rhode Island. It's called the Charlestown Art Gallery. And mm -hmm. I belong to the uh, Mystic Maritime Museum Gallery. I'm with, um, there's a gallery, uh, Dominic Regnanis is a, a designer. He has a gallery for designers in Northern Rhode Island. That's it's really for the trade for designers. But I do, a lot, most of my sales are online and I do have to, now that I'm back east, branch out to uh, the Cape and the North mm -hmm. Shore and, and around. I was in a, a pretty good gallery in Newport, but it was, they, I think they had too many artists for me and I was getting buried. So I, I yanked my stuff from there and I would rather be uh, shown well, showcased the right way. Of and you know what I mean? And Charlestown has been great to me. They, they took a chance on me back when people only bought my art because either they knew my dad or they knew me from TV and now mm -hmm. they're buying my stuff. They don't know my story. They just like my artwork. And then there's of course, Eric Lutz mm -hmm. that I have a website. Um, and then social media, social media is probably 70% of what I, what I sell through. Your Instagram is um, L U T E S Eric, right? At L U T E S Eric. Eric Lutz. I think so. 62 maybe might be a 62 in there mm -hmm. i'll put it on my i'll put it okay, on my yeah. website and then obviously eric lutz at facebook and eric lutz art at facebook. And what kind of paint do you use there is that watercolor oils, or? It's oils. oils. Mm. yeah i'm an oil guy that's so awesome so everything just comes naturally to you like do you sit and look at the boats and then that's how you get your inspiration yeah i usually take a lot of different pictures and i'll put them up on my computer and I always make a promise, oh, I really want to capture what's in that picture. And then before I know it, I've forgotten about the picture and I'm just kind of going off script. Mm -hmm. But it's good to have a reference, for, especially for boats. Make sure you get the rigging right if it's a sailboat. The shadows, you want to be consistent with that. But mm -hmm. when it comes to water, rocks, the shells I do, wood grain, I kind of make it up as I go. It's so New yeah. England. I love it. <laughs> yeah, do your, do your, mm, sorry. No, that was do it. Uh, do your kids um, paint? Does your daughter paint? Does yeah, paint? both of my kids are really creative. Uh, my mm -hmm. son especially is into music. He plays mm -hmm. electric guitar, acoustic guitar, sax, flute, clarinet. Abby's more uh, piano and vocals, um, but they all, they both mostly draw and paint. Uh, ben does a lot of 3D stuff with uh, uh, fiberglass resin and he makes Star Wars things for Halloween parties and like the armor and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so they're, yeah. That's wonderful. Well, you've made such a nice career and I'm totally a fan of yours and I love your oh, artwork. Good. And nice. um, I like watching the reruns. So thank you so much for everything that you contributed into the world. And your scientist girlfriend too, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> All right, thanks All right again, so you Lisa. guys, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Please be safe. We'll try here. We're the largest uh, city and state with the most cases. So I'm wow. here with Hendrix, and um, I'm just waiting for one of my masks to come in. But hopefully everybody will be okay, and we'll just get through this. Cool. And that's it. All right. Cool. Thanks, Eric. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Please um, pay attention and just stay indoors. Uh, that's what we're all just trying to do. And a big thank you to Governor Cuomo for everything and how kind you are. I put on my Facebook status that you're um, like a warm blanket and comfort food. So thank you so much. And everybody, please be well. And uh, let's take care of one another. And once again, please meditate with uh, Deepak Chopra. Please go over to Preferred Health Magazine and subscribe to our magazine. We put in great information. Uh, look at CanarsieCourier.com and Kings, uh, Kings County Politics, Pet Lifestyle Magazine. And uh, thank you so much. And I wish everybody a healthy and happy life. Ciao.